Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2018 Visionaries in Technology Lecture. My name is uh, Jeff Luke, and I'm the chair of the Visionaries in Technology Committee this year. And to, this year, we're very pleased to have Professor Roger Howe with us. He comes to us from Stanford University, where he's the William E. Ayer Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering. Um, he's also the faculty director of the, the Stanford Nanofabrication Facility. And this term, he's actually a visiting professor here at Sayer, and he's spending the term here. And many of you may have caught several of his lectures on microelectromechanical systems that he's been giving. Um, his academic career started at Harvey Mudd College, where he got a degree in applied physics. Then he moved on to UC Berkeley, earning a degree, a PhD in uh, electrical engineering. Following that, he's held uh, faculty positions at Carnegie Mellon and MIT prior to going to UC Berkeley, going back to UC Berkeley, where he worked his way up and eventually became the chair of the Electrical Engineering Division of the EECS department there and the Robert S. Pepper Distinguished Professor. In 2005, he moved to Stanford University, where he is to this day. Um, and during his time there, he also was uh, the leader, the director of the NSF National Nanotechnology uh, infrastructure network, which coordinated the facilities of 14 uh, nano facilities nationwide. And he's received numerous prestigious awards, including IEEE Fellow in 1996, and he was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering in 2005. He has co-authored more than 130 peer-reviewed journal, journal articles. Um, he holds 15 patents and has founded three startup companies, and he co-wrote a textbook on microelectronics. And so overall, he's very much a pioneer in elect electrical engineering, and he spent decades making innovations in the field of microelectromechanical uh, sensors and moving now more towards the nanoscale, working in nanoelectromechanical sensors. And uh, more recently, he's focused on applying this to bioanalyte detection, and uh, that's actually the subject of his most recent startup that he's now working to get off the ground. And so please join me in a warm welcome of Professor Howe. Thanks, Jeff. Well, I appreciate the um, opportunity to um, uh, speak to a good uh, uh, cross-section of uh, Thayer uh, students and faculty and, and perhaps others. Uh, this talk uh, would combine um, decades of uh, research in different um, uh, uh, areas, but with a common, uh, a common theme of resonance. And uh, the first part of the talk, I will go into uh, this um, area that uh, would involve uh, silicon micro uh, machining, microsensors, and the use of a resonance system as a sensor. And uh, I will uh, focus on um, a, uh, an ultra-precise, uh, ultra-sensitive accelerometer, uh, sensitive enough uh, to measure gravity. And so to engineer a uh, silicon uh, uh, device that can uh, uh, resolve uh, uh, centimeters of uh, elevation change is, is no mean feat. And I'll try to give you some perspective on some of the challenges in doing that. Uh, the next part of the talk, uh, there, there's resonance involved, but of a very different sort. Uh, we are um, um, uh, living uh, in a world of, uh, of uh, atoms and molecules, and in fact, as you know from chemistry, you have vibrational states in these molecules, and the challenge here will be design a, a system that we can detect those resonances electronically, and in fact, uh, quantum mechanics uh, will, will come in. Uh, a lot of it will be uh, hidden in this talk, uh, but um, uh, uh, there will be a, a resonance uh, uh, in a tunneling electron that will allow us to pick up that uh, uh, and identify those molecules. Finally, at the end, I'd like to spend some time uh, discussing um, uh, the, uh, my experiences in commercialization and uh, some advice for uh, uh, the next generation. So let's start off with uh, 
NASA's springs and dampers, which we all remember at some uh, point from some class, whether physics or, uh, or the equivalents, uh, you could translate this into the electrical engineering uh, uh, terminology. But uh, we have, um, with the assumption of linear uh, springs and linear dampers, a system that Newton would uh, give us the F equals MA. Now, in the case of um, accelerometers, it would uh, uh, often it's the reference frame that's accelerating, right? And so there's a minus sign for the inertial force, but we can, we can deal with that. Uh, if you uh, look at um, uh, pumping the system with a sinusoidal force, um, you um, uh, immediately, um, it's a linear system. You can solve the differential equations. Uh, in the uh, time domain, you will have a, uh, a displacement that is also a cosine, uh, but there's a phase shift to it. And so that um, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, it's linear systems. Now, uh, uh, in order to um, um, uh, look at the kind of system, it depends a lot on the parameters, but we're interested in underdamped systems where we're going to have a larger displacement than we would expect at DC because you have this resonant phenomenon. So I, you know, sketched up something that would be a classic underdamped system with a Q of, uh, as we'll see, about five. Uh, this is a uh, frequency uh, plot, and this is linear of the ratio of those amplitudes, and you can see we get a, a peak here. And that um, uh, peak is, a res is what we call the resonant frequency. And that resonant frequency, as you may remember, is related to the spring constant and the mass. So you have a very stiff spring, small mass, very high frequency. Uh, it's not exactly that because there's a little shift uh, for damping, but we're going to work quickly to make cues that are a whole lot higher than five and make the damping uh, become negligible. So um, uh, one other parameter I, I slipped in is if you go down a, a factor of one over square root of two and measure the width of that peak, um, uh, you can define a parameter that's very close to that. It depends on the engineering field what the multiplier would be, uh, and I don't want to get into debate with the mechanics engineers and, and all, but it's uh, uh, omega over delta omega with a, a small multiplier would be called the quality factor. So what we, uh, and you'll have to trust me, we want to maximize the quality factor. We want to make that almost like a delta function if we can. So how do we do that? Well, um, uh, and by the way, why don't, I'm an electrical engineer, why don't we do it with resistors, inductors, and capacitors? Well, I'm an electrical engineer that operates uh, around room temperature or above. You know, basically, I don't live in the liquid helium world uh, of superconductivity, uh, though there are materials that are a little bit uh, higher now. If you actually have lossless inductors and things, you can make wonderful resonators. But at room temperature, the resistor will uh, dull the resonator and you won't have a very high Q. The mechanical systems uh, actually are much better. We can um, use a very nice material like quartz, like silicon, some metal alloys, um, uh, germanium isn't bad, and we can minimize any internal energy losses. This is a material that is very elastic and actually very linear as well. We can work on our fabrication technology so we have beautiful smooth surfaces. It turns out that they're important in, uh, in uh, losses as well. We can uh, put that resonator in a vacuum so we don't have any inter interaction with gases, any drag from that. So we're sort of peeling this onion. And um, in fact, we can work on using a symmetrical mode of, the, of, a res, of a mechanical structure so that we decouple as much as we can from whatever it's mounted on. And I'll give you examples of that. Uh, one from uh, 1711, a guy named John uh, Shore was the uh, sergeant trumpeter was a title in uh, uh, the English court, and, that, and that's what he was. He was a, uh, uh, a favorite of uh, uh, Handel, the composer, and uh, appropriately, the, the, this is the musical tuning fork. It's actually a single-ended tuning fork um, is what would be the uh, engineering uh, description. And um, um, in fact, you, if you have an Apple Watch, uh, in there, you have a silicon version of that. This is a, a, a higher frequency, way higher than we uh, can hear. Uh, it's a miniature silicon part and, and um, uh, some features. It's really a double single-ended tuning fork to balance things further. 
And if this thing is vibrating in its symmetric mode like this, it is actually, uh, if you hit it, it will ring for a, a good long time. If you get both tines going together, it's a very dull and, and quickly damped thing. So we're very careful to excite this in these symmetric modes, both of these tines going like a musical tuning fork, and then the anchor is in the uh, center, and you have extremely high cues and a very good uh, 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 clock uh, for your um, uh, watch. So I would like to uh, show you, um, uh, in fact, some very early work that um, uh, my uh, first PhD student and I were involved with. This is a video, and I'll talk while it's going. It's a mechanical resonator. Uh, that is resonated at around uh, 50 kilohertz or so, 50,000 uh, cycles per second. And um, it's actually running in a scanning electron microscope, and it's, it's uh, a low quality uh, early uh, video. But um, uh, you'll see quickly, uh, soon as we look at the fingers, that it, they are actually moving, and we're electrically pulling these. Okay, there's electric signals on, on these fingers that are on the rigid fingers that are making it uh, resonate. And when we cut the resonance, it took around a second for it to ring down. And so if it's going 50,000 times a second, it oscillated 50,000 times as it rang down. So its Q is, is I think this was like 30,000, 35,000. And so uh, yeah, we uh, uh, verified that. We had other ways of measuring it. And so that, you can keep time with a structure like that. Um, in fact, uh, as an electrical engineer, um, uh, 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 Andrea Frankie got her PhD integrating that with uh, 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 CMOS, and so this amplifier sustains the resonance of, of this, and you have a one-chip um, um, uh, uh, clock at a frequency, in this case it was uh, on the order of 25 kilohertz, and, and I guess some features uh, 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 would be the, um, uh, that these electronics are off to the side. She actually uh, dragged them underneath and built the electronics directly downstairs to overlap and save uh, space, but it's not as photogenic because the electronics are almost invisible underneath. So uh, just to give you an idea of some other uh, uh, kinds of resonators at other frequencies, this is um, much later work, uh, and it's a disk, and you can see a little tiny defect in the middle. There's actually a little anchor uh, or via that uh, connects the disk to the substrate. Otherwise, it's just this uh, uh, two micron thick, and I forget exactly, uh, probably around uh, 30 or 40 microns in, uh, in diameter. So it's made using uh, IC fabrication technology, and it's sitting above the substrate. We have a, a, a DC bias on the disk, and we have a drive voltage and a sense voltage, and you might wonder, how is this thing going to move? Well, you're going to be at a very, very high frequency, and it's going to ring like a bell, and you're going to excite different modes. And so one um, thing is, how, what would the Q of this be? Well, this is frequency. The resonant frequency is around uh, 47.5 uh, megahertz, and the Q is around uh, 54,000. Okay, so this, remember we're looking for a delta function. We are getting closer to having something that's a delta function. If you have a circuit that this is part of, you're going to be resonating on that uh, frequency, and you've got a really good, completely stable clock. Now, the title of the talk was Physical Sensing, and it looks like we're kind of building an anti-sensor. Okay, that's something that's just absolutely nailed at a particular frequency, and, and it's not going to change. So we're going to have to figure out a way to uh, perturb it, but, uh, but I have been hiding something from you. Uh, there may be people in the audience that would think, well, these silicon resonators, don't they drift with temperature, right? The quartz is a special cut that gives you a very stable uh, reference, and you would be completely right. If you look at the resonant frequency, it's the ratio of a couple of parameters you might have learned in your basic classes, the Young's modulus of the material, the relationship between stress and strain, and the density of the material. Now, in um, most materials, um, you would have that, uh, uh, and in silicon, for instance, that is a very strong function of temperature in terms of 
tens of parts per million per degree. And so if, you're, uh, if we didn't deal with this in some way, uh, we would have uh, phones uh, that would, um, you would be talking to someone else <laughs> because we have to keep those frequencies uh, where they belong or you end up uh, having our communication system which is built on, on this sort of um, uh, timekeeping uh, 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 go haywire. So before we use these as sensors, we're gonna have to figure out ways of compensating them uh, and uh, one way to do it is to measure temperature and then do build an electronic system that would use that temperature measurement to correct, and that's called compensation. That gets parts per million stabilization. And people have tried ovenization, which means putting uh, uh, the, the chip in an oven. But uh, recently, um, uh, a student of Tom Kenny, uh, Liz Marie Ortiz, got her PhD doing something that um, her advisor, I was on the committee, we were skeptical how far she would uh, push this. And, and many of the graduate students may have debates with your advisor. And uh, uh, generally, the grad student is right. Uh, <laughs> push on, and it's always nice to have the, the advisors uh, very surprised. And, and uh, the, the shocking thing is this very boring plot where nothing is happening uh, over 10 hours. This is in parts per billion. And what she did is she ramped, um, I think she started cold, negative 40 C, positive 60 C, down to negative 40 C. And it's absolutely stable to uh, like getting toward atomic clock levels of precision. How did she do this? She used almost no power. She built a heater right into the resonator. Uh, and uh, that is possible in men's technology because a heater is a resistor. But we were just, uh, well, she was just heating uh, the, uh, the resonator. And it uh, was kept at a temperature above 60 degrees. It was uh, kept at 80. And she actually designed it so that was the optimum temperature. And the results uh, uh, were totally blown away. This is not quite out yet. This, the PhD was in, in August, so I thought you would be interested. So we can build some very good uh, resonators, what, what are we going to do um, to make them into sensors? Well, we have to figure out a way. Well, first of all, for those that may not be EEs, why are we so excited about having a uh, resonator as a sensor? We can measure time or its inverse frequency with unbelievable beautiful precision. It's, there's a long tradition in doing that, and um, uh, uh, it would uh, be a very different ball game if you're measuring voltage or current. Right, that's uh, uh, something that uh, we don't, there, there are uh, fundamental issues why time is something that would be great to have as our output signal. Uh, we're gonna have to modify the resonator so that somehow what we wanna measure is going to perturb it. And so, uh, how to do that? Well, um, we can look again to uh, uh, the musicians in the audience, and I would, uh, no musicians, I'm married to one, but I don't, uh, um, um, these are notes, right? And these are, these are strings in the violin, and you tune them, right? Uh, and uh, how do you do that? By changing the tension in the uh, string, you have a resonator that is a function of that, and you can dial in that, and, and if the temperature changes, you may have to tune it up again. And, um, and in fact, uh, uh, we need to build a system that couples into the resonator. There's other ways to, you can think of changing, but tension is one that I'll emphasize given the uh, application. So what does a, a tuning fork um, that we might use as a sensor look like? Uh, tines, uh, that's an old word for the uh, things on your fork are tines, okay? And there are two of them uh, that are anchored on these either end. And we have uh, these comb structures that actually are good ways to uh, drive the resonance and we can set up the voltages so we pump this thing in a nice way to get a really good cue. How are we going to hang on to this end of the resonator is uh, we're going to actually have to build some mechanism that, uh, that affects its frequency. So, um, well, one, one um, thing to remember in 2018, and, and this was true, I first worked on a resonant um, accelerometer in the late 1980s, believe it or not, and uh, there, were, there were old uh, inspirational works from the 1960s uh, that you could uh, look up, and not all of those mapped into our new technology, but some of them did. This is a vibrating, uh, so-called vibrating string, though these are actually wire um, uh, accelerometers, and it works. Um, let me highlight the uh, strings, and ah, I didn't want to show that, but uh, I will in a minute. So we have a vibrating string uh, driven by 
uh, 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 Lorentz force, it's a, they have a, a magnet around the wire and you're able to pump the, uh, uh, the resonance. Uh, it's hooked to a mass that's kind of supported so it only moves this way. It's coupled to another mass, so there's really back-to-back -back accelerometers. Why? Because they want to take a difference in frequency. One is going to get uh, uh, stretched and the other is going to be compressed, and they pre-tension them high enough so that they never actually buckle the, the, uh, the wire. Um, where do these come from? Government surplus. In, uh, in the mid-1960s, a couple of hundred of these uh, all of a sudden uh, became available to scientists uh, uh, for various uh, applications. Uh, I, I don't know how they, in those days, let people know. Uh, they came off ICBMs uh, because I think they got upgraded uh, with new kinds of sensors, and people got busy. Uh, some of them went to... Um, an interesting organization that uh, built a what they called a traverse gravimeter, and in the middle of this, they had the vibrating uh, string accelerometer. They had uh, various things uh, that are interesting. You can see how big a phase lock loop. So this is like 1968, 69. Okay, where was this going? Uh, to the moon. Uh, this um, uh, traverse uh, gravimeter is this module here. And the astronaut, uh, Gene Cernan, uh, has placed it there, and, the, and the, uh, they had to keep things quiet because this very precise accelerometer that was able to measure um, uh, gravity to five parts per million. Uh, they would um, uh, push a button and then get a reading and uh, transmit it back, and they mapped uh, what the lunar gravitational field is. Why? Because it's not constant. They were doing geology. Uh, they they um, actually um, uh, 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 were using this to probe beneath the surface of, of the moon. And so, um, in fact, with that inspiration, um, you could imagine a silicon uh, resonant uh, uh, gravity sensor. And um, uh, this um, is the basic idea. Uh, it's, uh, this is one-sided. You could mirror it. You have a, as big of a proof mass as you can get. Silicon is a great spring. It's not very dense, and so we always dream of, the, of, of getting more mass, but we can at least get more area. And uh, there's an interesting uh, uh, leverage mechanism onto our double-ended uh, tuning fork. This is, this is a schematic uh, diagram, and so um, what we will have is an input acceleration that will, um, let's see, uh, uh, input acceleration on the proof mass, you get an inertial force, you have a mechanical amplifier to the strain gauge, and you get this output uh, frequency shift. All the effort uh, to get uh, to couple to this uh, tuning fork is because we are trying to measure gravity to a tremendous uh, level of uh, precision uh, on the order of um, a factor of 100 beyond what was done uh, in a device that is uh, uh, much, much uh, smaller. This is in a fairly large chip, meaning the chip is 5 millimeters by 5 millimeters. And so the basic idea is you have the resonator, and it's, um, uh, th this is the resonator with no strain. You accelerate in a direction that gives you tension, and you get strain. If you want to be elaborate, you put another double in a tuning fork and you copy the uh, NASA design where it's, uh, where it's balanced. But in this case, it's not. This is work by a former student of mine who's a professor now at Cambridge. And uh, his group, um, uh, uh, his thesis was in uh, resonance sensing, and he's continued to work on that uh, and has been uh, 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 actually, uh, speaking of entrepreneurial activities, this is across uh, the Atlantic, but there's a silicon microgravity uh, uh, company that came out of Cambridge. And this is uh, unpublished work from earlier this year at a British geological survey uh, station in a unpronounceable place up in Scotland. Uh, uh, he can pronounce it, but he's been there. I, um, uh, I, I, I don't uh, know quite how that would uh, roll off the tongue. But in any case, what is being observed is what their sensor is measuring. And those are these scattered points. If you average it over 1,000 seconds and then compare it to, to a theoretical model that um, uh, is uh, available on the web called TSOFT, uh, what do you see? You see that things are not stable. You're getting variations on the order of plus or minus um, uh, 100. And what are the units here? The units are micro gals. What is a gal? 
A gal is a non-SI unit. It's called a Galileo. Uh, the the uh, geophysics community um, uh, would like to honor Galileo, and, and uh, so we use their units in, in gravimetry, one centimeter per second squared. And the reason is that for them, gravity is not a constant. OK, they're interested in deviations from it. So we just say g. But what g? Well, well this is g0 uh, defined that way. So it's about a factor of 1,000 uh, uh, gals per g. And the gradient at the Earth's surface is negative 3 uh, or that's microgal per centimeter. And, and so what are we measuring here? Well, you're familiar with ocean tides. Actually, Hanover is going up and down twice a day. Uh, the distance is only about a foot. Uh, and everything is going together in New Hampshire. Well, it's all granite, right? So it's one big rock. And, and unlike California, it's not fractured anywhere. So you're, you're just uh, insensibly uh, going along for the ride. And, um, and uh, this device is picking it up. And uh, that is very exciting. Why, why, uh, what would an application be? The research at Cambridge was funded by British Petroleum. They're very interested in monitoring oil and gas fields by gravitational imaging uh, to monitor where flood fronts are and, and et cetera. And uh, that is a, um, uh, uh, certainly a commercial application. But uh, coming from California, there's something much more valuable than oil. It's uh, water. This is a map of uh, the dry region of the US, uh, which uh, uh, would be roughly the, the Mississippi River uh, and there's various things mapped out, uh, like the states and the capitals, but there are also conflict zones. Uh, high conflict zone, which uh, is uh, in the uh, San Joaquin Valley uh, uh, which of uh, California, and various parts of Arizona, the Colorado River, Denver area, uh, and a few other pockets, and then uh, potential conflict zones in Southern California. Uh, this is conflict over water. Okay, water is a scarce resource. Groundwater has to be managed very carefully. And this, um, uh, 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 I think the, uh, uh, this is uh, 2008 work. Uh, there, there, certainly in California, the conflicts are, are very active in terms of uh, uh, different water districts competing. This is a gravity map uh, done at great cost using traditional instrumentation. And you can see the units of microgals. They're imaging with the sensor array uh, the state of a underwater uh, 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 water table and uh, looking at what, uh, what is uh, happening to that over a period of, um, uh, uh, what, six months? No, actually, it's, uh, uh, yeah, on that, you know, a little less than a year. And I guess the, um, the thought that you would be able much more cost effectively to image using uh, these ultra sensitive uh, uh, silicon sensors uh, you're you're able to see which was done very in a very early way on the moon and uh, commercially would have applications in, in uh, minerals and, and oil and gas I think for uh, water management this will be a major uh, innovation the last thing uh, I'd like to point out is that um, and this doesn't show up uh, particularly well for some reason it does on the screen, but you have two resonators. One of them is directly affected by the proof mass, and the other is weakly coupled to it by a small beam here. So these are two coupled resonators, and, and uh, in fact, there may be a chemical uh, uh, bond analogy, but you uh, basically indirectly perturb the system, and the so-called mode localization sensor, the ratio of amplitudes as well as the frequency shift can be very, very important for getting uh, uh, information. So it's a, it's a way of getting an even more sensitivity through not one resonator, but actually kind of a resonator system that you then perturb. Uh, this is a recent earthquake. I didn't know they have earthquakes in the UK, but this is the epicenter, and I don't think it was a very large uh, uh, earthquake uh, because they have these old buildings and they're still there, right? So, so it's not um, uh, the, uh, the rim of fire on, on my side of the continent. Uh, they had their mode localization uh, uh, in, in Cambridge, and then they had the um, uh, seismic station uh, uh, that the UK has down here, and you can see this mode localization sensor picking up uh, a earlier, uh, because they're closer, uh, signature of this um, earthquake going through. So I think the history of uh, science and engineering 
is that you increase the sensitivity of some uh, instrument and you actually, in quotes, can see further. And in this case, I, I think to have a much more cost-effective way of getting a, a high precision is going to have a lot of applications uh, in uh, uh, far beyond what I'm, uh, and I am an advisor to that company. That's how I, I got these slides from, from Ashwin, was kind enough to share them. So I think the, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the accelerometers and gyroscopes in your phone and I'm sure you all know that they're there, are uh, uh, devices that are made using the same technology but in orders of magnitude less sensitive. And so I think we will, we will see um, uh, potential um, uh, interesting applications of getting to these levels of, of sensitivity in the future. Now let's shift to this um, uh, different uh, type of, uh, of uh, uh, system where we didn't create the resonator, we're actually trying to interface with the resonator. And I'll start by going through this uh, 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 type of tunneling spectroscopy. And um, from your basic chemistry, you all know that there are vibrational modes in simple molecules. This is ammonia. Uh, and uh, this is a molecule you'll see more of. This is a self-assembled monolayer with these uh, backbone of carbons and, and sulfur, and, and uh, uh, these um, all have vibrations. This is a neurotoxin that you'll see later in the talk. Uh, at this point, if you showed all of the bonds, uh, it would be the, this blur. So the chemists uh, have come up with these um, uh, kind of uh, uh, higher, uh, 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 coarser ways of describing it. And so there are these vibrations are going on uh, and could be used to fingerprint the molecule. So how do people um, uh, identify molecules? Well, one way is spectroscopy. And if you um, uh, uh, irradiated these with the right wavelengths, you could uh, get evidence of, of those uh, 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 bonds and identify the molecule. The problem is uh, a lot of these bonds, and especially these more complex uh, structures, are very low energy. And so you either have to go to very uh, cold temperatures or very, and you also have to go to rather inconvenient wavelengths, like the terahertz would be uh, what people uh, would use to look at those. So I would like to focus on an all-electronic approach. And this is work, again, 50 years old. This is uh, work from Ford Motor Research, 1968, an accidental discovery um, of a, uh, a gold electrode and organic contamination. Uh, you can see the vibrational omega there, which is related, uh, we'll see, to the, uh, uh, the voltage we're applying on this. And they deposited a top electrode, and I believe it was lead, uh, on top of this organic uh, molecule. And they did the current voltage characteristic. They didn't think the organic was in there, uh, but they, um, um, uh, they soon found out they got very complex results, and that was because the organic molecules in this gap, as they swept the voltage and measured the current, interacted with the electrons tunneling across this very nanometer-type uh, junction with this unknown organic. And, um, and while they uh, resonated uh, the vibrational states with those tunneling electrons, they had an impact on the current voltage scan. So what, um, what do you see? This is work from a couple of months ago at IBM Zurich uh, in a paper that uh, applied this technique uh, to verify that they were getting uh, electrical contacts. This isn't the current voltage. They've taken the second derivative of the current uh, uh, versus voltage, and they're biasing uh, the, the uh, uh, organic molecule, in this case a self-assembled monolayer, and they're seeing that these peaks they're identifying uh, as a carbon-sulfur stretch, and this is a uh, CH2 WAG, I believe, and this is the uh, uh, scissors mode and a rocking mode. So these are identified with particular kinds of vibrations in, in the molecule. This is, um, uh, and that's a, a great paper, by the way, for, for many reasons uh, in, in uh, nature uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, these resonances, um, you know, we, it looks like this would be a great technique. You need a couple of electrodes. It be, might be nice to it. Uh, oh, by the way, the, um, what was in there? It was pump oil that had backstream. You, people used to use diffusion pumps, and those pumps, um, you, you attempted to keep the chamber clean, but in fact, the, the uh, oil would uh, end up diffusing, and so they had that in there. And later in the 60s and 70s, they identified the, the early uh, peaks with those uh, molecules. So those resonances are really nice. These measurements were taken at 4 Kelvin. 
Um, and so uh, the challenge then is um, 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 if you're someone living at room temperature or higher, uh, how do you um, uh, 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 get any information out of, out, of, out of something that has so much noise? Well, um, uh, in our case, we're not interested in uh, uh, sensing in the gas phase. Uh, we are going to sense in a liquid phase uh, with an electrolyte uh, with a redox couple, and we're going to tunnel across that junction into the electrolyte. And we are going to try to set this up in a way that we have an analyte at this interface and uh, see what we see. This inelastic electron tunneling spectroscopy was motivational. We actually don't quite see that. But again, what are we going to do at room temperature? What are we going to do because we're at room temperature? Well, I would like to go through a, a very, uh, oh, uh, what, uh, um, uh, there, um, kind of um, uh, uh, qualitative uh, look at what happens at that, that interface. Uh, the interface can have charge. One extreme is when it has very little charge. It has very little charge. You are in this adiabatic charge transfer range. The electrolyte and the metal are in tight communication, and you uh, don't see anything. Everything is going ground state to ground state, and you have very little barrier in, in uh, uh, having charge transfer between the uh, beginning and the, and the ending state. And so that doesn't work. Uh, so we kind of have to code it some way. But what about the other extreme? If we have a huge amount of charge, uh, then uh, we're going to have to put a significant voltage on this to get the electron to go over. It's going to have a lot of energy. It's going to scatter off things. And we're not going to have uh, 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 any particular uh, uh, success in, in getting information off of here. So this is the uh, self-assembled monolayer. We put too many chains in here, and we have too high a barrier, and we also don't see anything. So <clears throat> uh, what's the best place to be? The best place to be is in the middle. Uh, and this would be uh, mod uh, changing the chain length on the self assembled monolayer to make sure the electrons are in a position where they can pick up the information while they tunnel through. Now, um, that's quite interesting. Uh, how do you do it? Well, first thing, we have to we'll find out we have to make this, and uh, that's no mean feat. Um, so uh, uh, after we get through that, uh, the electronics are another major challenge because, again, we're at room temperature. We're going to have to figure out a way to functionally be uh, uh, not at room temperature. And uh, so let's start on, on uh, fabrication. The, um, uh, the theory of this leads to a sensor that is in the nanoscale um, uh, even the macro lead is 50 by 50 nanometers. Now that for uh, uh, people in the nano world is not extreme nano, but um, in fact, uh, in order to get this to work well, we don't use that as the electrode. We use a, nano, a gold nanoparticle. It's uh, on the order of five nanometers typically, and these are these organic barrier molecules that set things up. And notice they're shorter uh, than they were in the, in the extreme case where the things were too far uh, away. And out here we have a, uh, a, 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 these are electron acceptors, these redox uh, uh, pairs or couples, and we've selected it, to, uh, we've used various uh, uh, redox ones. This is very ferrocyanate, so um, cyanide. So how are we going to uh, make this? Um, uh, you may recall I'm, I'm uh, into the nanofabrication world, uh, and um, uh, the uh, uh, first thing that we would normally do is here's what we want to make. We would get a process flow. We would try to design mass and, and do some integrated process. Now, the problem with that is that um, uh, the parasitic capacitance, according to the model, which is in the paper that uh, 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 the J. Fizz Chem uh, uh, paper, uh, has to be extremely small. That's going to be very challenging. Uh, in, in order to fabricate. It's not impossible, but that's uh, uh, difficult. And then the other thing is that we don't really understand. We have a qualitative model, and so we're going to do a lot of functionalizations. We're not going to do that at the wafer level because we don't really know what we're, gonna do, we're doing. So we're going to, you know, if we have a wafer, we'll saw it up into individual devices. And so, well, why don't we make them one at a time? So what we did was serial fabrication Kind of like I got a tour of the machine shop this morning, right? And, and you have, uh, uh, you make one thing in the lathe, 
And if you want another, you get another piece of metal and you make another one. And so that's not the way electronics uh, has revolutionized the world. But um, we decided to um, uh, do that for prototyping and did it fairly efficiently. We used a, an STM tip as the substrate. Okay, substrates are generally flat. STM tips are as sharp as you, you can imagine. These are very, very pointed, nano-sharpened uh, uh, pieces of metal. Uh, but we figured out how to make things, and that was thanks to a postdoc who had done his PhD uh, using tips at Arizona State, and he brought that kind of tip thinking into my group. And so how do you make something on a tip? Well, the first thing is you have to order some wire. And because um, we're going to make our own. You can order tips uh, from uh, commercial uh, uh, vendors. And this is this platinum iridium uh, quarter of a millimeter diameter wire uh, with a very blunt tip. And uh, you have to figure out how to sharpen it. Well, go in the literature. This is a uh, Japanese Journal of Applied Physics paper. Um, you can um, uh, build the circuit, order the chemicals, and do an electrochemical etch that will give you a sharp tip. And so you do that in PowerPoint and in reality, <laughs> okay? It's sharper in reality because of the limited uh, pixel, uh, pixelation. So you, you get this ultra sharp tip. We actually tried to improve the circuit, but um, um, it, uh, it, it turned out it was uh, actually rather effective and uh, more robust than our bleeding edge uh, kinds of circuits. The next thing we knew, need is a, um, an insulator. And uh, to do that, we uh, go to a process that's extraordinarily useful in technology, atomic layer deposition. And uh, this is a, a digital kind of deposition where you, you, you put layer by layer uh, of the uh, material down, and it's able to cover extremely, um, because of the, the, of the self-terminating reaction, it can cover things like an STM tip. And so we went and covered it in PowerPoint. And uh, we actually covered it in reality. So that's uh, after the deposition of hafnia, 40 nanometers of hafnia on this tip. We need it insulated because that's really the electrode. How are we going to make the little sensor site? Well, there's a tool called a focused ion beam uh, that is like a scalpel of gallium ions that can etch uh, uh, and uh, uh, a very uh, fine, high-resolution uh, 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 structures and uh, so in fact uh, we we have a tool like this at uh, at Stanford and uh, we etched in PowerPoint and in reality okay this is uh, uh, I had a picture of a tip that looked like we would had target practice on it while we were doing different holes it's kind of fun but after about the 50th tip uh, the grad students uh, yeah it's you don't want to do thousands this way but again it's uh, we were building things so we, we could uh, especially explore the functionalization remember this is an electrical engineering group the postdoc is a chemi from uh, University of Illinois and we figured out this isn't the exact thing but this is what worked in PowerPoint to add the, the animation to get the nanoparticle there uh, so uh, what do we do next well uh, we're going to mount this in this uh, soft polymer that's popular in the uh, biomedical applications uh, microfluidics called PDMS. And um, what we would like to do uh, is not have this thing poking out. We want to have it just flush if we can. So we set up a microscope um, and um, uh, figured out a way to pull it backwards, having pre-punched a hole that was a little smaller and uh, kept pulling until it was essentially flush. And um, uh, the secret to success here uh, was when I mentioned uh, that um, the people that did this were high school students, okay? Because I get email from uh, either the parents or the high school, or here are my, you know, I'm, I'm a good student, I, I'm willing to work. And, um, you know, and so we, we uh, at Stanford have more and more of the high schoolers in the, in the uh, research groups, and, and generally uh, they have really good hands, okay? In fact, uh, the first one that did this is a brilliant pianist. She is currently an EE major at UCLA, but uh, still a brilliant pianist, and, and at this point didn't drink any coffee at all. So <laughs> you have good hands, good eyes, and uh, uh, you'll see her acknowledged at the end. So in any event, this uh, ends up being um, put into 
a, a classic electrochemical cell with a reference and counter electrode, and we do electrochemistry. And we wouldn't um, see much of interest unless we address this, uh, this problem of a potentiostat and, um, and, and learn how to uh, reduce the noise or even uh, reduce the effective temperature. So this is a connection to work um, uh, 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 that involved BEMS, where we were using electronic feedback uh, to control the dissipation or the damping in this resonator. Oddly enough, at this time, the problem was the Q was too high. We were trying, uh, we meaning uh, my uh, student Clark Nguyen and I, were attempting to detune this to make the Q lower than um, uh, the 50,000 for reasons we were trying to make electronic filters. But be that as it may, we figured out a circuit that would increase damping electronically. We didn't add pressure, you know, there was no change in the physical system, but electrically we simulated that and we simulated positive damping. And uh, you can see the feedback comb, we have a split comb driving on this side. And um, we were successful in doing that. You can see controlling this resistor, we can control the sharpness of the peak. And this configuration is for increased damping. We actually toyed with trying to go the other way and make the, the Q extremely high, but it's a very sketchy thing when you're so high already uh, uh, to, uh, to get it to go to infinity would require uh, more time and more uh, 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 effort than we were uh, interested in at that time. However, uh, in this potentiostat, uh, potentio by, by uh, uh, removing that dissipation, we can actually suppress the noise uh, in the um, uh, in the system, because this um, is going to be a room temperature measurement, and this is our model of the electrochemical system, just as a uh, resonator, uh, we're using X instead of R for the uh, resistor inductor capacitor, and, um, and so we would like to um, effectively uh, reduce that um, uh, dissipation in the system with feedback. And lo and behold, uh, we were uh, successful in that. Not only in a classical system, but in the quantum mechanical system, uh, we are coupling the, um, uh, these tunneling electrons. They're effectively seeing the noise in the electronic circuit, not the room temperature bath. So um, uh, you can read this uh, interesting paper in Journal of Applied Physics a couple of years ago about the uh, quantum mechanical modeling of that. So we hook these two up, <clears throat> this circuit and this um, electrochemical system, and uh, what we, um, um, you know, what's so special, right? You can get potentiostats, and uh, uh, is this really all worth all of the effort? Well, the answer was a bunch of people uh, got PhDs, uh, uh, and, are, and a cut, one of them is still working on his PhD in ever improving uh, 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 potentiostats. Um, uh, here's an, a comparison between a $10,000 Gamry uh, potentiostat, which is the best, lowest noise we could find, uh, and the power spectral density of our uh, an earlier version, we're better than this now, of, of our potential stats. So we actually have something that is extraordinarily uh, low noise, and if you look at what the electrons are feeling, or how, what they feel like, it's, it's not 4 Kelvin, but we think it's around 30. Now, the purists would say the temperature is not defined, you're not in equilibrium, right? Well, uh, we're engineers, and uh, we, we um, uh, we're okay with uh, cheating, okay, <laughs> basically to, to get information out of things we will, uh, 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 we will put, and I guess that squiggle says that I don't really believe it's, it, it's not really 30, but um, in any event, so we've gone to great efforts uh, to do something. What do we actually see? Well, if you take the same system, and let me click ahead, uh, you have um, uh, the 50 nanometer hole, uh, and, I, and I actually deleted this just before the talk. This is the oxide rather than the hafnia, and uh, functionalized with the five nanometer gold uh, nanoparticle, et cetera, in the potassium buffer, and et cetera. Uh, you do it with the uh, gamma ray, and you do it with a uh, custom potentiostat, you see dramatically different uh, IV curves, and uh, the reason would be that you have um, a, um, uh, the, the uh, 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 
state of that interface uh, uh, at a, at a, and the uh, electrons tunneling in a very different mode. We have a charge that's affecting that uh, hysteresis. But that's, not, uh, that's useful, but not everything uh, that we're interested in. Because if you look at this um, uh, IV scan, uh, this is um, uh, earlier, we would uh, go to great lengths to average. And uh, we're going uh, forward, and then we come down reverse. And remember, the um, people doing these uh, tunneling spectroscopy, they do second derivatives. We tend to just do conductance. And you're seeing evidence that's uh, quite interesting. Uh, and uh, you might say, what is the molecule that we might be uh, seeing some vibrational states? Uh, and the answer is that the, um, the electrode is coated with a self-assembled monolayer, right? We put a monolayer on it, and these electrons are, are, are tunneling and interacting with that. So, so if we um, uh, add an analyte, and uh, this is uh, late editing where I added uh, the leucine and deuterated leucine. We, we got a uh, leucine with a deuterium instead of a hydrogen on one, uh, uh, one of the bonds uh, as a test of this. And we looked at the IVs. Uh, they're different, macro differences. But at the conductance level, you can see some interesting things where you have peak shifts, uh, which is what you would expect, because the deuterium, of course, is more massive. So you're messing with the vibrational states. And I, I think that's, uh, that we found very interesting. Uh, the analyte um, is now part of this. You're seeing the self-assembled monolayer and the analyte, which um, actually makes it interesting. So who was funding this? Um, by the way, this is not NIH. This is DARPA. Uh, DARPA was, had a big program in quantum phenomena, and we were the only bio program in it. And then after this, it was um, uh, the Biological Technologies Office. At this point, uh, we uh, picked a target, and the target was bont A, that monster-looking molecule that's a neurotoxin. And we were supposed to find that in human serum. And I had spent a lot of money on sample preparation and everything. We were running out of time in the project. And so the program manager um, uh, just said, uh, forget the sample prep. Stick it in serum and see what you see. <laughs> and um, under duress, we did that. And you see these interesting family of curves with a half microliter of serum uh, that we, where do EEs get serum? From these big supply companies, uh, Sigma Aldrich. Uh, this is not from the um, uh, faculty or the, you know, this is, uh, or the uh, graduate student or the postdoc, let alone the high schoolers or the undergrads. But uh, uh, you can order this stuff, and uh, this is diluted in our electrolyte uh, so that, um, in fact, um, uh, we have uh, picom. Uh, picomolar to 100 atomolar, and the conduction, conductance spectrograms are intentionally overlapped to show you we have this tremendous amount of you know, what, what, what in my PhD, if I showed this to my, his, my advisor, I was doing a uh, chemical sensor, he would uh, uh, say this is hopeless, okay? This is ab absolutely hopeless. What I want is a straight line, okay? How on earth are you going to do that? Well, it's 20, uh, this is uh, circa 2014-15, and so what, what information can we pull out of this? And uh, we started with MATLAB pattern recognition. You know, we're EEs and, and have standard toolboxes of, uh, of trying to uh, do pattern matching between references uh, where we, we, um, we look at a reference that's the buffer only and the buffer plus the analyte. And then we have a negative control that's unspiked serum. And we start uh, to see what we can find out. And so what do we do? We, we do a whole bunch of things. We, we, um, uh, you, know, you may be familiar with wavelets. It's kind of a, uh, a, a, a signal processing uh, technique related to Fourier transforms. And uh, why would we do that? We're seeing periodicity in those uh, uh, scans. And uh, ultimately find the correlation coefficient um, between an independent co component of the reference and an independent component of the, the serum uh, spiked with our analyte, this particular concentration. And uh, what do we see? We see this heat map of uh, correlations. And guess what? The correlation is over 0.5, uh, which means that there is uh, detection going on. Um, that was uh, interesting because at this limit, um, ELISA's uh, having difficulty. We're on the edge, and so is this uh, 
uh, standard uh, reference that's uh, uh, typically used. So we um, actually did a bunch of concentrations. Um, this is in the electrolyte uh, and found uh, a, a relationship between the strength of the correlation out of all of the signal processing and the concentration and error bars. Now, it's uh, 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 not uh, huge amounts of data. And by the way, 0.5 um, is where you're kind of uh, running out of any correlation at all. There's no signal here, but up here you're certainly getting signal for this neurotoxin. Uh, and again, since we're EEs, we're not really playing with neurotoxins. Um, you may have heard of Botox. That's what's in Botox at uh, dilute concentration, but we were using a surrogate, uh, which means it's a, a molecule that EEs are uh, certified to be able to use uh, safely. Uh, so um, in any case, um, what we showed is that, that there is kind of an existence proof that you can do broad spectrum electronic uh, sensing, right? This, uh, there was no probe for the Bonte, right? There's no fluorescence going on. There's no charge tags or anything. This is just seeing it in the soup of uh, serum. But um, when you think about it, it turns out that we don't have anything in our body that really looks like a neurotoxin. So if, you're, if you are uh, uh, putting neurotoxin in serum, it stands out like a sore thumb, right? Because it's uh, a neurotoxin and all of our molecules are are tame and friendly, and uh, so that's not very impressive. So our next homework assignment from the program manager was that we should measure concentrations of cytokines, which are native in serum, and that required a different way of doing data analytics, and there's a, uh, a new logo that I'll get into there because this is uh, post-Stanford, but uh, uh, there's a lot of training going on. There's a lot of feature extraction. I guess we typically pull 40 features out of these uh, conductance spectrum, which is a lot of dimensions. Uh, in fact, you're in this uh, very high, um, uh, high dimensional signal space, and you're looking for uh, classification uh, of your, uh, uh, of your uh, 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 sample against uh, various bins of target concentration. In some cases, we're doing more than one cytokine at the same time, so they're competing targets, and we're trying to estimate what the actual concentration is uh, and do that on a laptop, uh, 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 you know, which would be a high-end laptop running for a while because this is a substantial amount of signal uh, processing. Uh, the time to result is um, uh, 25 minutes at this point. Uh, the scans and, and then the computation, which is, we'd like to go faster, but that's where we are. And I guess we've been doing some proof of concept cytokines, uh, and uh, uh, these would be the, uh, uh, you know, ter ter they have interesting names, tumor necrosis factor, uh, uh, you know, interleukin and uh, uh, various 1, F, and 10. And, um, and, and so you're seeing limits of, lower limits of quanti uh, quantitation that are, impressive and pretty impressive um, specificity and um, uh, select, uh, sensitivity and specificity that would indicate that this might actually be um, useful. Uh, and um, uh, we would be benchmarking these against the uh, standard assays. Um, so lately we've been doing other assays, and you might be interested in some of these. Uh, this is an antifungal uh, drug. This is related to E. coli, uh, a toxin uh, from that, uh, you hear of people getting sick from that, and also from salmonella. This is uh, staph bacteria, staphylococcus, and uh, peanut uh, allergen. Uh, and uh, all of these are things we, uh, well, the, the bottom four are what we don't want in the food chain, right? And so there's a lot of testing that would go on for these. And you might wonder how we are um, testing for bacteria. Are they coming up to our sensor? The answer is no. Um, uh, we um, uh, are looking at a, uh, an extract of something like cereal, okay? And um, in that background, if there's a bacteria in it, the whole soup is modified. All the biochemical ma makeup of that, not directly from the bacteria, but uh, various other reactions that are going on from the bacteria's metabolism are things that we would be picking up and uh, getting uh, 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 significant um, significant results in, in comparison to culture, which would take a good deal longer, uh, this um, uh, is uh, 
uh, I, I think, encouraging. And with peanuts, we've gone all the way to pure peanut uh, flour. So we have a, a sensor platform that I think has a lot of applications. That's one of the problems if you come up with something that's really new. Where is the um, initial application, right? And we would be uh, wrestling with that. So that is a, um, a whirlwind tour, and I'm looking at the time, and I will wrap up with some uh, uh, thoughts on commercialization of resonances, uh, both quantum mechanical in this tunneling phenomenon and these micromechanical resonators for doing uh, sensing of, of physical and chemical um, uh, 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 variables. So I actually uh, have a family uh, experience that I remember at the age of 10 or 11, my dad, uh, who was an electrical engineer out of Purdue and UCLA, uh, he, had a, he and his friends, uh, I remember this because they were at the kitchen table okay, at our house sometimes, and they were working on the weekend, coming up with a new kind of memory, thin film magnetics. Um, uh, the company, uh, they, they uh, all went back to work and found other jobs uh, when they uh, uh, got the press release from this uh, other startup called Intel uh, that had uh, <laughs> developed a purely electronic memory, and theirs was uh, uh, not going to uh, uh, work. So actually that was uh, somewhat abortive. In my case, as a prof uh, young professor, uh, the venture capitalists were aware of silicon sensors. I often told them that, they, that it was premature. Uh, because there weren't the, um, the infrastructure that you needed to do startups. Uh, it was just too hard. No one knew how to package anything. Uh, the, you had to build your own expensive clean room. So, um, uh, and then, for reasons that are, I can discuss privately, I spent a large part of a very uh, boom time writing a textbook. Um, and um, that's a way of making extra money if you're a professor. Um, but if you're t targeting engineering at an upper division level, there are just not enough of us. And uh, commercially, uh, you could uh, view that as um, uh, uh, it, it's a pro bono, to use a legal term, uh, because <laughs> the income, it, it, it isn't there. So in any case, in the uh, late 90s, a student of mine, um, uh, uh, well, we had, were co-inventors of an interesting technology. There was a startup. I had arranged a leave of absence from Berkeley. And then I pulled the plug after six months. And uh, why was that? Uh, basic ethical uh, uh, disagreements uh, with my student, who I knew I thought pretty well, but actually he put the company above everything and would even be operating way too close uh, to the line on, on things like uh, uh, who owns what IP. And uh, I simply uh, um, uh, I, I, I thought this is uh, not going to end well. And uh, I got out. And um, so that, uh, I think, is an option. You know, is the, these dynamic uh, teams, uh, sometimes the best decision is to lead the team. Uh, later, there was a much happier experience other than this 2008 meltdown uh, financially. A company called Silicon Clocks that uh, ended up being acquired by a famous uh, company in Texas, Silicon Labs. There was a company uh, with a student um, a uh, Duke undergrad, brilliant guy. Uh, we had a uh, tunable um, uh, optical detector. In 2010, it was tough to raise money, and there wasn't a critically uh, demanding application. The business case wasn't there. Uh, the student uh, ended up um, uh, joining a VC firm as a uh, uh, not as a partner, obviously, but uh, he has gone in, into that uh, industry. So again, that was some investment of time, but I think the outcome was probably correct. Today, we might have been able to raise the money and get started. And I'm currently in this bio uh, thing that you saw the logo of uh, Probius. And so I don't have a huge amount of experience. Some people have you know, so many companies going all the time. But on the other hand, I, I had a, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, activity going on, like most of the faculty at, at, in Thayer would have have relationships with various uh, uh, other, you know, various companies, large and small, scientific advisory boards, and that sort of thing, which I think is a good way to get a lot of uh, insight. So, what, a, what about Probius? How did this come about? Well, the, uh, these are the cast of characters. This is a restaurant uh, walking distance from our place, appropriately named. 
Um, and uh, Emmanuel was a postdoc of mine at Berkeley days, and he, he was the CTO of the previous company. He's now the CEO. He's about 10 years older. Uh, and Shatanya uh, Gupta is the uh, chemi from uh, Urbana, really is the core uh, driver on the technology. And so the three of us um, got this company going. And, you know, in, in meeting with other companies, I think it's very important to get uh, your really core fundamental value straight. Maybe it's, that's an experience with this uh, uh, abortive company. And I guess uh, the one I would point out, you think, oh, well, everyone's honest and everyone <laughs> openly communicates. That actually is very painful sometimes to be both honest and, op and uh, you know, it's, uh, the only thing worse is to not be. So to have a bunch of people who are going to kind of have the environment where uh, people that are not um, outspoken feel they can speak uh, out is super important and not easy. And so that human side, uh, it, 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 I think, is, is very important. The other thing is um, we are really interested in seeing this impact healthcare. Why? Because healthcare needs help. And um, uh, I, um, uh, I think engineers can do a lot. But in fact, I, um, I, you know, we all, um, uh, in the first company, uh, Emmanuel and I, everyone had kids or kids on the way in the company. Uh, so that actually meant that uh, there were limits to how far we would go. Uh, and I think having that uh, conscious uh, thing that there's something more important in the company, companies can fail for reasons completely uh, out of your control. So you have this uh, balance of uh, priorities I think is really important. If everyone's not on the same page with this, then uh, maybe uh, uh, that's not the right company for you. The other thing I point out is that there's a whole bunch of... Um, uh, we have uh, a large uh, uh, DARPA SBIR, and that um, is a phase two that's helping a lot. There's an incubator um, uh, that has helped with chip design, getting us the tools. You may have heard of analog devices. Uh, they are down in uh, the Boston area, and uh, we aren't in their garage incubator, but they are an investor. And then uh, this is a um, something to keep in mind. StartX is loosely affiliated with Stanford. Uh, you don't have to be in the Bay Area to apply to it. Uh, it's an accelerator rather than an incubator. That means they don't charge you anything. They actually invest in your company, uh, which uh, uh, is, is good. Uh, and the, the last uh, point is we've got lab space in a retirement project of a, uh, 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 a Stanford Medical School professor who bought a wet lab, bio lab, uh, in Silicon Valley and has a rent space to a whole bunch of companies there's a Duke spinoff, a uh, bunch of Stanford people, and uh, he um, doesn't take equity, and, and it's a blast. But it's not big enough. It's like a madhouse, and he um, uh, is um, uh, double the age of most of the people, other than yours truly, who show up at this, and, and it's uh, something uh, enjoyable. So I, I'd like to point out that, there, um, uh, that this um, uh, industry of sensing and um, uh, silicon uh, is uh, something that's very fragmented. And there's all kinds of different uh, uh, products, each one of which uh, appears to be mostly growing. And then this is old. And if you go to 2017, you get to 20 billion, right, worldwide of all these different sensors. And then you go on, and this is the same company uh, in May. They say, well, the current market is 12 billion. And they projected it to be 20. And so they're the same, you know, are they that bad? And, and the answer is, I think it's apples and oranges. How you count these different uh, components, do you count more of the system? Uh, if you narrow it down, the chips aren't that valuable, right? It's, it's more that what they're going into. But in any case, they would be seeing uh, huge growth in consumer. And here we are in this medical area, which I think they might have undervalued a, a bit uh, because I think the, um, uh, the pressure to do things in healthcare is, is high, and I think we're going to have some breakthroughs. That we won't single-handedly make this bigger, I don't think, because this is 2023. Uh, but there's a lot of different aspects to this, and I think that means opportunities for engineers that are broader. You, know, you have this undergrad engineering uh, degree, uh, those that are in Thayer and the audience, and I think that um, uh, gives you 
uh, you know, you say, well, it's too broad to be useful. Actually, the 21st century, uh, you, you know, to be a specialist is a problem, a hyper-specialist. You have to be able to uh, see opportunities in places that might involve different branches of engineering. And I think that will mean that you come up with ideas that people have not thought of before, and you might have uh, connections with other Dartmouth people, um, and, uh, yeah, and you can get that started. So I think um, your projects uh, could end up nucleating a startup, not only that uh, capstone, uh, but you, you know, you're um, ha having serious amounts of work, and you're, when are finals? Like 10 days or something, right? I mean, I, I, I'm amazed how many people are here and uh, awake, because <laughs> you haven't been sleeping much this week. But in any case, uh, this um, experience is super important, because actually, um, it isn't that far from a startup, right? You uh, have four or five people and, and, uh, and sometimes three or, you know, and how, how you interact. Uh, are these people you would want to go in with a startup? And if not, what is, what is lacking? And maybe you can look in yourself and say, what, where do I need to grow? So this is not, you know, this is, uh, this is serious, uh, you know, lifelong uh, impact. Uh, Dartmouth changed the entrepreneurial network to uh, Magnuson now as the uh, 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 donor for the Center for Entrepreneur Entrepreneurship. This is a huge uh, opportunity if you can find a way to uh, leverage those resources. That is uh, uh, one of the uh, many benefits of being at Dartmouth. Now, if you end up in grad school uh, here or maybe at Stanford or some other uh, school, uh, you, you know, this uh, map of the U.S. Um, does have Dartmouth on it. It's a node of this innovation core that the National Science Foundation has uh, started. And there, there we are, uh, and there's an upstate New York node. Um, actually, I, um, I know a Bay Area startup that was attached to the DC node. Okay, even though there is a Bay Area node, the reason they're heavily Department of Energy, it's an energy-related startup, they needed to be in Washington. And so they, I don't know where they stayed, in the YMCA or something, you know, but the startup showed up, and it's a boot camp for entrepreneurs. I have not gone through it because I claim I'm, um, I've accumulated equivalent experience and uh, it might kill me. Uh, so in any case, uh, you, um, you have to be willing to work really hard. The impact, this all started at Stanford with a uh, adjunct professor, Steve Blank, who had the idea of trying to capture how to do startups and teach people. My students who have gone into it, two of them are CEOs now, both of whom initially uh, tilted toward academia. Uh, they even come from academic families, okay? I don't, but they did. And now they are running companies. And um, uh, so I think that's uh, something to, to keep in mind. Now, there's a lot of acknowledgments, and they would include the high schoolers um, that uh, were doing some of the assembly and colleagues. Um, the, um, uh, the work was funded by a seed grant uh, that's internal to Stanford, and then we got two DARPA programs, one uh, um, in this quantum program, mesodynamic architectures, and, and uh, Jeff Rogers and, and uh, Matt Hepburn uh, is now uh, interested in this uh, project. Uh, uh, he's running a project on, on uh, dialysis-like therapeutics. We are doing the sensor for that. Harvard is doing the filter. The goal is for these blood affections uh, called sepsis that you would hack a dialysis machine and actually strip out of your blood what was causing the toxic shock or the, uh, uh, the bacteria. And so lastly, a uh, former student, uh, Professor Ashwin Sessia now at uh, Cambridge, who is the, uh, uh, he and his students have founded uh, Silicon Microgravity. So I appreciate uh, your hanging in there for a talk that did uh, course run over, but uh, uh, in any case, uh, 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 it's great to uh, be at Dartmouth, and I'm uh, still around, and if you want to uh, uh, shoot me an email and meet on some, uh, some topic, I'd be happy to. I'm in McLean 213. So thanks for your attention. Thank you.